this week on the Back Table Podcast. I've gravitated towards the interventional radiologists who behave like surgeons and physicians, not just technicians. And I can't tell you the number of times where I'll send somebody who's got a biliary stricture, maybe they've got a an anastomotic stricture from an HJ and it's benign or something. It was, and you know we send them for an initial PTC and then you're going to have this whole protocol of upsizing. And the patients come back and they're like, yeah, I never, never saw the doctor. No one talked to me. They didn't tell me the plan. And I'm like, you know, well, you're not radiologists. I mean, but by the way, you guys are both not radiologists. You are, you do things to patients. You're proceduralists. You're like surgeons, just minimally evasive. And the same goes for interventional gastroenterologists. I expect my interventional gastroenterologists to talk to the patients, have empathy for the patients, see the patients longitudinally, understand the big picture. And it's not just like they go home, oh, call surgery. They're your doctor. We're not your doctor. Well, you just put two tubes in my liver. You're my doctor. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Back Table Podcast. If you're a new listener, welcome. For all of our regular listeners, welcome back and thank you for listening. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or our website, which is backtable.com. Now a quick word from our sponsor. RadPad was developed by physicians for physicians. Clinically proven radiation protection during cine and digital subtraction and geography. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RadPad radiation protection shields for all your floral guided interventions. See radpad.com for more information and contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and a no-brainer radiation protection cap. And don't forget to tell them that you heard about it on the Back Table Podcast. Now, back to the episode. Our topic today is surgical interventional perspective on patients with biliary disease. I'm Chris Beck. I'll be your host today, interventional radiologist based out of New Orleans. To help with the topic today, we have interventional radiology represented by Dr. Mark Lesney. And from the surgical perspective, we have Dr. John Martini. John, Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Thanks. Happy to be here. John, will you just go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us uh, a little bit about your training, but also your practice and kind of what that looks like now? Like how long you've been out? What patient, what kind of patients do you see? What kind of surgeon are you? Sure. So I'm a hepatobiliary surgeon and um, I've been out of my residency about 23, 24 years now, believe it or not. I did my fellowship training at uh, McGill in Montreal, and that was in liver transplantation and HPB surgery. Uh, my practice has evolved a little bit over the years, so I, I don't do transplants anymore. I do 100% HPB surgery. And about that 60% is malignant diseases, pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, and about 40% benign diseases, which include a variety of things, including biliary stone disease, strictures, bile duct injuries, pancreatitis, and that kind of thing. So it's a pretty organ-specific uh, rather than a disease-specific practice. Are you in private practice, academics? I'm at the uh, Carolinas Medical Center, which is a big academic teaching hospital. We're now with Wake Forest Universities, but it's a, it's a very academic practice with residents, fellows, medical students, and all that. All right, Mark. Yeah, I think a lot of people in the audience know you, but um, tell us a little about yourself, about your practice, and how you know John. Yeah, so I'm Mark Lesney. I'm one of the vascular interventional radiologists also in Charlotte. Um, so I graduated residency and fellowship, um, I guess, 13 years ago uh, from Duke. And then what was neat is my first job out of fellowship, I had the opportunity to, to work not only with the giants of interventional radiology at Hopkins, but also John Cameron and his team at Hopkins. And then I basically went from there to Carolina's Medical Center, Atrium, where I work with the Giants, like John Martini and his team. So the interaction, and it's not sarcasm at all, they're tremendous, and they do as sort of high quality work as anywhere in the world. And so I think that does challenge us as interventionalists to keep up with them. Um, and I think that's true of any field that we interact with, that we are sort of held to a standard by our surgeons, and our surgeons here happen to be outstanding. And so I thought this dialogue would be, would be fantastic. Yeah. So I'll actually lay some groundwork that happened uh, off camera and off microphone. Originally, Mark, we had asked you to do like, so we already have like a, a topic that's already been done. We haven't released it yet. It's with Barraza and uh, Brian Holly. Um, they talk about like basics of biliary work. And so we thought, okay, we'll just do like, you know, sophomore, junior level with Lesney, um, just like fill in some of the gaps. 
And then you thought, well, actually, I think like the more interesting conversation would be to talk with like HPB surgeon and like, I think like what you wanted to bring in John's perspective on this stuff and how like they kind of push you and the things that they can offer patients that maybe not everyone's aware of, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I have the outline, you guys have it. Um, but if you feel like we have to go off script, like that's totally fair game. So I thought we could bake, break it up into like patients with benign disease and malignant disease. John, is this like a fair way to like start like thinking about like patients and like referral patterns for you guys? Sure. Yeah. Good way to think about it to start. Okay. How do you get referred patients? And when you get referred patients, what does your workup look like? And I know it's going to vary from patient to patient, but if the broad strokes, broad strokes for this. Well, there's a whole spectrum of how patients get their way to me. I would say what differs for someone like me, an HPV surgeon, very little of what I see comes through the emergency department at our main hospital. I would say 90% of things come from the outside facility, other hospitals, even competitor hospitals, and small referral centers. So I'm probably this weekend alone had four or five patients that were transferred from other hospitals with a variety of uh, liver and pancreas problems. Um, so that that's kind of how patients get to me. And from a variety of specialties too. So sometimes they'll be referred by a gastroenterologist at another hospital, a patient that came in Friday with a with, with biliary obstruction and uh, they thought you know we needed to see that patient. Okay. How much comes from oncology where you already have a diagnosis? Like when I'm thinking about like uh, malignant etiologies of like biliary disease. Yeah. Less and less. I mean, I would say it's more of the flow of patients is usually from a, an HPB surgeon or I, I'll say surgical oncologist. There's a lot of overlap with, with people who would refer to themselves as surgical oncologists, it usually flows to medical, but not always. And there are certainly uh, types of diseases that come from a medical medical oncologist first. Uh, an example would be patients with ocular or cutaneous melanomas who develop liver met. Uh, those patients are usually under the care of a medical oncologist here at Atrium. We have very good medical oncologists specializing in melanoma. And once a year, I usually get a patient from them and saying, hey, John, can you can you do something about this patient? They've got an oligometastatic melanoma, and, uh, and then we get those patients. Okay. So a lot of them are being referred in. I assume sometimes it's inpatient. Sometimes it's just through the outpatient clinic. If you had like your ideal scenario, what information are they already coming with? And then can you like, what are some of the common things where you have to like fill in the gaps and like, oh, this is the imaging that we try and get? Or I'm just trying to like, you know, I, I know it's difficult because we're covering like a kind of a spectrum of disease, but I'm trying to like elucidate, like pull out a lot of questioning where we get a little bit of insight into your work up of these patients. So usually when we get a call from an outside hospital about a patient, this is a typical scenario, or we get a call from a gastroenterologist out in the community with a patient with jaundice. And sometimes it, depending on the facility, sometimes they may have already had, let's say an ERCP for uh, biliary stricture, malignant stricture, benign disease, whatever it is. Uh, sometimes they've already had some cross-sectional imaging. And so we're fortunate nowadays that when I get th that phone call, I, I'll, first thing I do is I, I ask them, just push the films over electronically. I mean, that's that has revolutionized the way I can practice medicine because I can now look at scans on patients that are three or four hours away and I can triage what they need when they need it, if it's urgent, if it's not urgent. If I need to call one of our interventional radiologists and say, hey, this patient's coming, they're going to need bilateral, you know, PTC is probably a hyalurcholangia carcinoma. So that's probably the the best thing that's changed with the, the advent of electronic data sharing between hospitals. If you have like your druthers, uh, and I know it's tough when you're taking all comers, um, C CT or MRI for like advanced cross-sectional or sometimes both, right? It totally depends on yeah. the disease. I yeah, mean, yeah. most surgeons, and I, I can, as a surgeon, I can generalize, most surgeons like CT because they understand it better and they just simply don't understand all the different sequencing and things with MR. But there's no doubt that MR is superior in my opinion, especially when I'm dealing with liver pathology. Obviously, you can you can look at biliary anatomy a lot better. You can differentiate between different liver tumors. 
FNHs versus adenomas versus hepatomas. And but for pancreas disease, often li- most surgeons still prefer CT. Although if it's done well, and you know if it's really done well, uh, and an MR is 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 as good as a CT for let's say if I'm going to operate on someone with pancreatic cancer. Okay. So Mark, similar line of questioning. I'm assuming that sometimes, or let me even ask you if this scenario exists. Does uh, a scenario ever exist where like patients with biliary disease, interventional radiology maybe is the first phone call? Like, like how often is it a scenario where like they don't involve surgery and that you guys are getting consulted either in patients or something like from outside the hospital system? Yeah. So that happens not infrequently. I don't know the percentage because I can't tell you the denominator. Of course. And I think one of the, uh, the the beauties of this multidisciplinary conversation is there's a lot that goes on that we don't see, right? So patients that only you know John's team interacts with are just GI. And so I think it's just interesting to think about. And so similar from our perspective, we'll get calls from the ED or from GI directly in a patient who may not have surgical disease or may not have surgical disease that we know about or that have emergent disease, someone who's septic, someone who's uh, acutely obstructed, and we'll get involved obviously right from the get-go. The way that it works like uh, within the hospital system that both of you guys are a part of is a little bit disjointed or is it the scenario that if, you know, surgery is consulted that very likely interventional is going to be consulted or like, I'm just trying to like get a perspective, like you just take it as an as needed basis, like in terms of like consults or is there like, hey, like a big conference where we all get together and talk about like complex pillar disease? Well, it's healthcare in the United States. So by definition, it's somewhat disjointed, right? However... I think it is important to have collaborative uh, conversations. And so, so well, there certainly are multidisciplinary conferences all the time uh, between our two, our two groups. I would say my involvement often is John calling me or me calling John or his team or, or my partners and sort of having this sort of phone call conversation, um, if need be, um, rather than anything formalized, especially in the acute setting where you're not going to wait for a conference in two weeks. Okay. No, I get that, of course. Yeah. Or something more complicated where it's, no, we need to have a discussion about this. And that open line of communication, um, I think, is really important. And as an interventionalist, I value not only, one, because I want to know what's going on with the patient and sort of there's some subtleties and nuance, but two, I think that does establish a level of trust and um, connection. And so there are certainly physicians in every single section where they may have, you know, 10 partners but the ones that sort of you talk to the most are the ones you're going to talk to the most. Sure. Uh, and it's a never ending cycle. Okay. All right. Is there anything, um, John, that you want to talk about that maybe I just didn't even ask about specifically or that you want to discuss like regarding workup of patients, like anything that, cause the, the audience that we're, we're talking to is going to be mainly interventional radiology. And if like, so the scenario that I'm imagining happening, um, is that sometimes like surgery is not on board or there are a lot of doctors who aren't in, tertiary referral center. So they, they have general surgeons, but then it might, may not have H, uh, HPB surgeons. Is there anything that else you can give us just to, the workup side of things to help like steer interventional radiologists in the right direction? Sure. And if the answer is no, we can always just cut that whole question out. So it's easy. No, I, I think that, you know, the your, your last question to Mark was, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity in healthcare. And um, I don't know that that's avoidable nor necessarily desirable. I think when you're at a large facility that has people who are subspecialized, we kind of naturally find out who are the people who are A, interested in these diseases and B, are good at what they do. And I think it takes both. So what sometimes happens to patients is they they don't find their way to either HPB surgery or interventional radiology or interventional gastroenterology, because those are the three facets that really work together let's say a patient gets transferred on a hospitalist service and it's that whole shadow world of medicine, the medicine side of the hospital, like they may have no idea what's going on or what the appropriate next step is. And so the fortunate thing is if they find their way to any one of those three facets, the interventional gastro, interventional radiology, or HPB surgery, we're going to know who needs what. And it's nice that it works that way. But before they get to that point, if they're on a medicine service, even in the medical ICU, sometimes they don't know what to do about these diseases, proper workup and management. So unfortunately, we're not going to talk about interventional gastro very much in, unless like there's a way we can kind of like talk around it um, just because we don't actually I know a couple of good gastroenterologists, interventional gastros, but um, we'll just stick with IR and surgery for right now. So 
What's on the outline is kind of options for treatment. And I know it varies from like biliary disease, whether you're, you know, so much heterogeneity within the pathology that we see. But I guess like one of the things I like want to hear from you, John, is maybe where you've seen re- referrals get sent to you where necessarily like people didn't think there were surgical options, but surgical options exist. Or if, you know what I mean? Like um, blind spots within maybe interventional radiology or hospital or, or oncology. Like those are the kind of patients that I was kind of wanting to talk about. Sure. I'm trying to think of what the right one. I, I In my mind is someone that Mark, you may, may know, or maybe Eric, but I saw a patient in the hospital who was a young woman in, in her 40s with a large central intrahepatic cholangial carcinoma from Charlotte, was in our competitor hospital system in town, was told by their surgeons that she was not surgically resectable, went to Houston, went to MD Anderson, was also told, we don't know if we can do this, maybe we're going to recommend chemotherapy. She had biliary obstruction, so she had, I, I think she had an indwelling right-sided PTC at the time. And um, we saw, we just, she, she came to Charlotte. She just wasn't happy with her opinions. She checked herself into the ER, which is a very unusual way to find themselves to me. But she just basically walked into the ER because someone said, hey, you need to go see these guys at, at Carolinas. And yeah, sure enough, you know, I saw the, saw the patient. I'm like, look, there is a multidisciplinary approach to your being resected. Chemotherapy, probably transarterial therapy. She needed biliary, de- more definitive biliary uh, decompression. And then down the road, we would probably do something like total liver de- uh, venous deprivation. And then she gets out of her section. So that, that's a nice example of somebody who f- went all the way to Houston only to come back and just by perseverance found their way to the right team. That's very nice. That's a good story. Yeah. Can I give you a, um, can I give you an OBGYN metaphor here? Yeah, of course. When I was a third year medical student, my OBGYN professor, who was this brilliant old school gynecologist, used to tell us when he saw a patient as a gynecologist, the first thing he thought was, what does this patient have if it's a man? The lesson being, think outside your specialty because you can get pigeonholed pretty quickly. And I think as interventionalists, we run into that a lot. We say, oh man, there's nothing else to offer from an interventional standpoint. Okay. Is there anything to offer from a surgical standpoint? Is there anything to offer from an endo, from an endoscopy standpoint? And I think picking up the phone and saying, you know, John, I'm out of options here. What I'm doing ain't working. Do you have anything to offer? Is really powerful, even when that patient has already had an opinion from an outside center, because you never know what other ideas the people you work with have. And I think that's a lesson that I learned pretty early that's that served me well. Also might speak to the high level work that you guys, you and your group are doing, John. I mean, that's that story is, is pretty profound. Mark, a similar question, but the, the question I wanted to pose to you is, biliary cases that get referred to you that maybe are maybe not surgeries involved in a situation where you were glad that you called John and you thought, wow, that was a huge value add. This is like really opened my eyes to something, right? I thought like options were closed. Like, can you paint like a couple, maybe a scenario or two like that? Yeah. I mean, I think it happens all the time. I think we get a little bit arrogant in interventional radiology, to be honest, because we think we are the most cutting edge novel specialty. And we are obviously. However, we have limitations. And so, you know, we could talk about sort of the emerging fields of, you know, endobiliary laser, endobiliary, you know, magnetic compression for strictures and all these sort of crazy things that are coming down the pipeline, RF. But the bottom line is we also have limitations. And so I have a classic example where actually it was with with one of John's partners, where we had a patient with some uh, benign uh, post-transplant or post-surgical stricture. We upsized them. We did, you know, large bore intubation and the patient didn't respond. And, uh, And, you know, someone on my team left it as, well, nothing to do, indwelling catheter the rest of their life. And I'm like, well, hmm, that seems, seems abrupt. So I got on the phone with, uh, with HPB and I talked to them and we came up with another plan to do something different for this patient that instead of sort of resigning them to a a, a bag or a a tube the rest of their life, that maybe there were other options. And so sort of this patient centric approach of just because I'm done doesn't mean our team is done for the betterment of the patient, I think is really essential. Okay, so that's a that's a pretty good segue to get back over to John. So John, let's talk about like benign disease. And what I want to talk about is, and you can paint like the patient scenario that however best uh, elucidates it, but like an ideal patient that limbs themselves very well to like a, a, uh, a surgery, and then also want to like reverse it and then talk about like 
patient factors or pathology that lends itself or, or doesn't lend itself well to surgery. Wow. Okay. We're talking benign disease, Benign right? disease, benign disease. But we will get to malignant disease. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, so surgical therapies for benign disease, we break them out really into two kind of categories. People with stone disease, well, actually maybe three, stone, stone disease, biliary strictures from injuries, surgical, you know, gallbladder biliary strictures, and then maybe other reasons to have benign biliary stricture. So what usually we, we kind of look at those patients and see what, if it's stone disease, you know, that disease has largely been taken over by interventional GI. And so the t- number of times that we do a surgical common bile duct expiration for stone disease or something like that is really less common. Having said that, I recently did a, a robotic cholecystectomy and common bile duct exploration with the uh, with these uh, cholodogoscopes uh, because the patient had had a prior uh, a Bill Roth two gastrectomy. So when when an ERCP is unavailable, then your options come down to either it's a percutaneous transhepatic approach or surgical. And if they need their gallbladder out, anyways, that sort of pushes us into that. On the flip side, you know, somebody who's had 15 operations and they already have their gallbladder out and they've got, uh, maybe they've got bilateral, they're going to need bilateral disease, or if it's more proximal, that's a patient that we're going to want to have seen and treated mainly by uh, IR as an upfront therapy. Now, they they may may need something down the road, but generally speaking, those are going to go the route of interventional. And when you say go the route of interventional... um... In that type of patient population, what's your decision tree with uh, GI versus IR? Well, I mean, it depends on it where in the in location. The, you, you know, if it's a something distal, there the advantage of an ERCP is a couple fold. One is that it, they get to actually visualize and look at the ampulla, so you can rule out this patient has an ampullary tumor a- adenoma. Maybe they've just got papillary stenosis or benign stricture distally. That's going to be usually better managed because they can do a sphincterotomy. If it's anything above, let's say, the cystic duct, that's something we we feel better with IR because it can be managed from above. They can do bilateral PTCs. We can do spyglass from above, all of that stuff. That's sort of where we make that dis- that decision, probably somewhere mid- mid- midway in the bile duct. Okay. So location is pretty important. And then sometimes, at least in my experience, sometimes depending on the patient, you actually just need both and you just don't know until they've been scoped or IR is tried or, or yeah. So I know we're oversimplifying it. Um, Mark, anything to, anything to add to that as far as um, when you're kind of brought into the picture for benign disease? Yeah. I'll, you know, the thing I'll add is I think it's also dependent on local expertise by all three of those groups, right? So if you're in an interventional department that doesn't offer biliary endoscopy, you're going to have, or spyglass, you're going to have um, probably less options than one that does. If you're in a group that GI is just general GI and doesn't do a lot of advanced ERCP, you're probably going to get a lot more work as an interventionalist and so forth and so on. So I think local um, skill set also comes into effect. Yep. Are you guys, and it sounds like it from what John said, Mark, but you guys are offering the full gamut of like complex biliary interventions like endoscope. We do. We scope. We you know we try, but you know every time you open up a journal, there's someone describing some new technique, and so we try to keep up. But we know by definition we're going to be outpaced to some extent. Um, and so we do try to incorporate it all. And, and we're lucky to have surgical colleagues who back us up when we try some some new and sort of weird things. But yes, that is ultimately our goal to, to offer care that's second to none and offer the spectrum. All right, John, um, can we switch gears and talk about like malignant disease? Kind of the same set of questions though, like um, which patients lend themselves very well to a surgical approach and then which patients is it better to involve Either I mean, you can, we can either talk about GI, medical oncology, IR, whoever, but mostly IR. Yeah. When we see someone with a malignant process, let's say a intrapatic cholangiocarcinoma or a hyalur cholangio, Klatskin tumor, small tumor, but right at the... We kind of weigh, first, do you want to do decompression of the liver from above or below? And a, a lot of things go into that factor. Access, local expertise, what's your... What's going to be your plan? Do they have predominantly one-sided, you know, let's say the left, the, there's more tumor on the left and both the left and right are obstructed, but but our plan is to save the right. So we tend to, we would tend to drain the right, usually from above is the way we usually do it. Just it's, it's a little bit better durable thing. 
rather than having a stent come from below. But there's a lot of factors that go into that. And you want to, some of it comes from just the upfront discussion of, hey, what's our plan for this patient? What are are the potential long-term options? Is there a surgical option? Because if there's not a surgical option, if we think uh, this patient, she's got metastatic portal lymph nodes and there's tumor involving the main portal vein or the or the right hepatic arteries encased, then we know that patient may never get to surgery. And then we, we're planning, okay, what's the least morbid way to palliate this patient from a liver standpoint so that they're not, they don't have cholangitis and their bilirubin can come down to reasonable and they can go on to get palliative chemotherapy. There's a lot of factors that go into that. And it's, I would say that's pretty complicated, but there's lots of factors that go into that and, and we're try to do what the best thing for that patient is. Sure. John, this is something I think that doesn't happen as much in our section, just in our group, just because you guys are so involved. But in other hospitals, when do you think it's appropriate for HPV surgery or whatever surgical specialist to say, you know what, I'm tapping out. There is no surgical, this patient's not a surgical candidate. I don't need to be involved in this patient's care. GI and IR, it's all you. Boy, that's a, I, I'm going to tell you, that's a touchy topic because some HPV surgeons don't want to be bothered if it's not someone they're going to operate on down the road. And I, don't feel that way. I mean, uh, it was a patient who's been in and out of the hospital who's actually out in rehab right now. You probably know who I'm talking about. She's never going to have surgery, but I, I operated on, I did a, a Whipple on that patient like eight years ago and she probably has recurrent disease in, in the hilum. It's my responsibility to take care of these, help guide these patients and sort of not, I don't like the quarterback theme because that means it kind of puts me in a position of, hey, I'm the only one in charge. But surgery should be involved in these patients, even if they're not going to have an operation. It's just, I think it's the right thing to do if you're an HPV surgeon. And that goes back to the kind of, what I said earlier is that you got to find some people that are really interested in the disease, not just the operation. That's why we take care of people with necrotizing pancreatitis. I may never operate on those patients, but somebody who understands the disease and what are all the options and rather than just having one specialist who has one tool doing their tool or their their procedure. Does that make sense? That does. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, John, is like in, in the sense where maybe you're you're not playing like you're you're not going to be operating, or maybe you will later on down the road, but not anytime soon. Are you pretty? Do you guys help be prescriptive with like what type of drainage you think would be most successful? Like when you're trying to give advice to interventional radiology about what's the best way to decompress a patient. And, and also, like, the, the real question that I want to know is, like, I want to tap into that thinking. Like, what are you, what are you thinking whenever you're looking at, like, biliary obstruction, whether they need left-sided, right-sided, only right-sided, yeah. you, you know what I mean? First of all, I think the more experience you get, the, the more you tend to rely on your IR colleagues to, to determine which, what drains the best. You need to upsize the drain. You know, let's say you've got an eight French right-sided PTC and, and the LFTs are coming down and the patients, why do you need to go up to a 20? you know, like a 18 or 24 drain, you, you don't, the drain's working, Le- you know, what's one more intervention going to do? If we're trying to upsize a stenosis, like an astomotic stricture at an HJ, that's different. So I try not to micromanage what my IR colleagues do in terms of drainage, but it's good to have a plan. It's like, look, this patient's going to get an extended left trisegmentectomy in three months. I want to save that right posterior pedicle. So just, I don't want anything in there. If you need to drain the left, drain the left or the right anterior sector. But um, it's that having that plan is really important so that everybody's on the same page. Mark, similar question, um, but like flipping it around a little bit. So one, how do you think about biliary decompression? Like whether a patient needs right-sided, left-sided, both. And also like when, when were you glad that you talked to like surgery and you're like, oh man, it just wasn't, that totally was not on my radar. So that is such a good question. I think as interventionalists, we have a chip on our shoulder because we have this idea of, you know, don't, don't tell me how to do my job, right? I don't tell you how to do an appendectomy. I don't tell you how to... And that's fine. And clearly there are some people who, who overstep their bounds, but don't confuse autonomy with collaboration, okay? Or lack of autonomy with collaboration. So if someone calls you and tells you what to do just because they want to make sure they're in control, that's different. If someone calls you and says, here, I was wondering if we could do it this way because this is what I need or this is what the patient needs that you may or may not be aware of, then that's completely different. And I think you have to have a little bit of um, maturity and ego check 
to realize the difference. And so, um, and again, this happens with collaboration. And so, you know, don't be offended. It's like when someone calls you for something very basic that either isn't indicated or whatever it is, don't forget someone's calling you because they need help, right? Someone's calling you because they have some information that may or may not be useful to you. The fact that it, that you, you can't help them or the fact that the information wasn't useful is irrelevant, okay? That doesn't mean you can't treat them with, with respect and sort of with an eye toward the patient. So I think that's really important. In terms of, of drainage, you know, a lot of what we do is, is algorithmic at this point. Now that said, if you work at a place like John and I work at, a lot of the algorithms break down because we have complex patients that require sort of niche approaches. And there, I think the dialogue is really important. And the last thing that I would love to hear John address is patient wishes. I heard a fantastic talk by Isabel Newton on uh, compassion consent and this idea of getting the patient involved in their care, both, you know, pre and post procedure. And so, you know, I can tell you some of the conversations we've had with respect to, you know, what do patients want? Do they want a tube hanging out with them for the rest of their life? Do they want to gamble and put in a stent that may or may not occlude in a day, a week, a month, a year? And I think that conversation is not taught as well in interventional residencies as it probably should be. And I'm not sure about the surgical perspective. John, to you. Yeah, that's a great topic. Uh, we're not taught very well to that either. In fact, you know, I have to remind myself because when you're dealing with a lot of the cancers that we deal with, a lot of these are the more the, the survival rates for cholangiocarcinomas, HCC, pancreas cancers, biliary diseases, gallbladder cancers. You know, the survival rates are are very low, despite what we think of we're doing. So it's I do think it's important to talk right to the patient. They may have their kids and their grandkids and everybody in the room that's pushing to have these big operations done. But at the end of the day, you've got to sit and talk to that 83 or 85 year old who's going to undergo a big liver resection or, or pancreas resection. And you got to lay it on the table. And maybe the older that I've gotten, the more, the more honest I've been with patients in terms of the mortality of not just the surgery, but the cancer. That's really important. So, Mark, the, the question that I wanted to ask you is, um, Isabella's talk, was it the one at... Um, Western NJ. Oh, Western NJ. Okay, yeah. I, I heard that one. I thought that was very, very solid. Maybe we can link to it. Um, I'll see if we can find... Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. So, one of the things I wanted to touch on, uh, John, was uh, you mentioned like someone put in an eight French tube for a biliary, you know, right side of eight French tube, and like you, know, you actually got the appropriate response, and, and that's fantastic. But it just made me think... Is there ever anything that you see from outside institutions, either from GI or, you know, Gen Surge or IR, that you're like, wow, they they really are missing the boat on how to approach this? And and I know I'm not trying to knock anybody, but I'm I'm just saying like, because what I so, you know, we're talking with Dr. Mark Lesney, and then, you know, some other people are at academics institutions where they have every resource available to them, but there's some interventional radiology docs that are, you know, out there in like Monroe, Louisiana, or, you know, whatever small town. And so I just want to, like, if you can give, like, that kind of insight as to, like, these are these are ways to think about it, or these are things that you do not want to do if you want to look like you know what you're talking about. Wow. Well, I will say we, we'll we probably try and slam the people that are not here, which is the interventional GI guy. Perfect, you know, perfect. Exactly. That's some, exactly sometimes what we're going to do. We'll That's going to play very well. There's a there's a academic institution about two hours east from here that has very aggressive interventional GI it does some really unique kind of biliary drainage and malignant situations, which, okay, it's interesting, uh, like transgastric stents into the left hepatic duct, avoiding the, you know, and okay, those are, those are interesting. Our GI people have been doing transduodenal covered metal stents across bi distal biliary strictures. The problem is if those go wrong, if those fail, that is a surgical emer ur urgency. I won't say emergency, but uh, we, we're seeing more and more of that. And, you know, I think it's good to push the envelope. I mean, we all try to push the envelope surgically, uh, endoscopically, and, and IR. And as long as there's been a discussion about, hey, you know, it's not f five o'clock on a Friday and my son's got a basketball game, you know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it right now. So I, I really think those kind of advanced maybe pushing the envelope type of interventions really should be discussed by a team. And everybody knows, that, like, hey, like, you know, if Mark's doing a portal vein strictureoplasty for a patient of mine who had a Whipple with a portal vein graft, I need to know when he's doing it so I'm around, that kind of thing. Okay, absolutely. Mark, anything that you think that 
interventional radiology is kind of missing the boat on or things that you've seen like from a like, I mean, if you're in a referral center and you're seeing things from all over, any common threads you can kind of pull on there? Yeah, you know, I think the blessing and the curse that we and probably GI have to deal with that surgeons don't is that we have this uh, notion that oh, everything you do is minimally invasive. So just do it. it. You know, it's who cares? It's low risk. Nothing's going to happen. And it's not like we're cutting the patient open. And I think we more than sort of any other in more invasive specialty fall into the trap of just because you can, should you? And so patients with, you know, three and four biliary tubes and, you know, hyler stents, you know, that clearly are never going to stay open. I think we're, we tend to do potentially more harm in those situations. And we frequently have conversations where we get patients referred, you know, often by, you know, GI, not necessarily surgery, but whomever for, you know, some stent reconstruction of some unresectable disease. And the answer probably should be, this is neither surgical nor stent reconstructable. This is not an appropriate candidate. And so either we're happy to pull the tubes and let the patient go to hospice and just understand the the, the risks and, and sort of natural outcome of that in a good conversation with the patient and their family, or place a stent and know that the risks and complications of that, but a conversation I think is really important. And I will tell you, just like the technical expertise, being in a smaller hospital where you encounter this once every six months, the conversations are much harder too. Um, and so I would have a low threshold to sort of reach out to other hospitals that that do a lot of this and say, hey, I have this patient, you know, th- is this appropriate? Because my surgeon says it is, my GI says it is, my IR says it is. I don't know that it is. And and have that conversation. Sure. Speaking of biliary stenting, are you guys doing a fair amount of that now, Mark? We are. I mean, it's sort of GI does a lot of the biliary stents, a lot of the, um, you know, temporary plastic stents. Yeah. Um, but uh, we do a fair amount. We're also trying to be a little judicious about it and not be super aggressive with stents that we know are going to have low patencies just to buy the patient another percutaneous uh, drain, you know, a couple weeks down the line. Okay. I was curious, um, are you guys doing any, um, and I'd like to know how you feel about this too, Mark. I'm sorry, John. A patient with uh, biliary obstruction, maybe it's a hyalur obstruction, um, instead of, uh, but let's just say like for some reason, you know, like they have metastatic disease somewhere else. And so I'm trying to like paint a palliative scenario where you skip the internal external drains or biliary drainage, and then you just go right to stenting, Mark? We tend not to. We tend to drain those patients only because usually by the first time we see them, they're obstructed. And, you know, there's a hypothetical concern that if you manipulate the tract too much, it can cause some deleterious effects. Um, but I know some people have done it and success successfully. Um, so I don't knock it. It's just not been our practice. Yeah. John, any feelings about that strong or one way or the other? Yeah. I mean, usually these... Um These are patients that, again, you're going through the process of, is this patient have a, if we're dealing with proximal biliary strictures, usually these are malignant. I mean, that's the vast majority of these are malignant. Then you're thinking, is this patient going to have a surgical option down the road? You usually will start with one-sided. Usually I try to drain the side that's away from the disease, that is the contralateral side. And usually if your liver is working, you only need to drain one side, right? Um, you could have the left side of the liver could be completely obstructed. The right side, if you've got a functional liver, that should drop your bilirubin. Um, and in cases where that doesn't happen, you have to ask, hey, does this patient have advanced intrahepatic or in pedicellular dysfunction, cholestase, cholestatic jaundice and biliary cirrhosis? So at those points then, you know, when I'm thinking about somebody who's palliative, if I can, I'd, optimal would be drain, get an external internal drain in both sides. And then I think the best is kissing metal stents from above. And, and that just seems to be more effective than an endoscopic approach to that. And I think they probably would tell you that as well. In cases where the patient I mentioned from who went down to MD Anderson, I mean, she's got a huge left central left-sided tumor. She only has a right-sided PTC. We basically said, okay, we're going to sacrifice the left side anyways. There's no reason to put a stent in that or a drain. Just let it be, you know. That's going to be sacrificial. We're probably going to go the way of, uh, you know, TLVD on her anyways. So there's no reason to drain both sides in that situation. And it's, again, it goes back to having what's the long-term plan for this patient. Our goal in that patient is resection down the road. So I don't want metal stents. I don't want a metal stent in that patient. I just encountered a patient who I offered to put in a stent and the GI doc says, well, 
the plastic stent is preferred because they're going to surgery and uh, plastic stents are preferred to covered metal stents pre-op. What are your, can you comment on the size of the stent, how that affects your surgery? If we're talking about distal biliary strictures, like for presumably distal cholangio or pancreas yeah. cancer? Yeah. So my experience in those patients in a distal metal stent, covered or uncovered, is they have a tremendous amount of desmoplastic inflammation in the in the pancreatic tissue in the right around it's always that way and so as in the last five years my practice has completely switched for pancreatic adenocarcinoma from operating up front on most patients to now most of my patients get neoadjuvant chemotherapy and that mandates biliary stenting and I've encountered more and more of the patients with metal stents having it just a more difficult operation. So that I've gone back to just telling our GI colleagues, just put a plastic stent. I know it's only going to last for six, eight weeks. That's okay. If we need to swap it out, we will. So my preference in a resectable, somebody who's going to go to surgery after three months of chemotherapy, my preference is a plastic stent. And I think it just causes a much less of a reaction. That's number one. Number two is... We're seeing a lot more patients who have a covered metal stent placed by GI where it occludes the cystic duct orifice. And then the patients come in with cholecystitis. Now you're in a pickle, right? Now you've got to decide, wow, is, is this patient need their gallbladder out? Are they going to get through the rest of their chemotherapy? You know, so if I have, my preference would be plastic stents. If they're locally advanced, they're never going to get to surgery. Then yeah, put a, put a metal stent in there. But the covered metal stents, I think I try to avoid them. No, that's helpful. And for the interventionalists listening out there, the two things I would remind you is one, if your surgeon sort of has expressed that to you, keep in mind there are fenestrated covered stents where you can deliberately avoid the cystic duct. The other thing is, you know, it's been 10 years ago, we described in an SIR abstract use of plastic stents placed antegrade by interventional radiology. And so you can certainly talk to your, if you're not familiar, talk to one of your local friendly interventional GI folks and say, hey, do you mind just teaching this to me real quick. And when we've done that to ours, they've said, we're happy to it'll take 15 seconds. So in that situation, Mark, like you're using the same ones that GI uses and you just, it's almost like putting like a double J or something like in the kidney or something. It is. I mean, I haven't in years because our GI folks are so, so good. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they tend to, to do it. But, um, but yes, when we used to do them, that's exactly right. It's a pretty straightforward system. So John, in, in your experience, you guys, and Mark, you can wait on this too, covered stents, crossing a cystic duct, you're seeing some of those go to like presenting with cholecystitis? Yeah, absolutely. We see it uh, fairly regularly, you know, and it's because they get above and they cover the cystic duct orifice and it sort of forces your hand. You've got to either operate, maybe you're going to just take out the gallbladder or it pushes you to go ahead and do the upfront resection. But a lot of times, I think that, the, again, not to fault our gastro, gastro colleagues, but Sometimes patients will come to me now with metal stents up front without there having been a discussion about resectability. You know, good. usually it's like you get like a 75-year-old with a new pancreatic mass, biliary obstruction, and they'll put a metal stent in because they don't think someone ever would ever be stupid enough to operate on this patient, right? But we are. So well said. we are. I mean, I'm doing a whipple on a 93-year-old next week. I mean, my God, I don't know what I'm doing, but that could, that could be the title. I, that could I, be the title of this episode. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, some of my, you know, the fact is natural selection, right? So if a patient is going to make it to 93, usually they're physiologically a better, uh, more morphology than my 70 year olds who still smoke and drink, you know? So it's like weeding out the pack. If you ever get a 90 year old with a pancreas cancer, they're probably fit enough to ha have a Whipple. Yeah. So they're probably pretty good on the year old. Hey, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, John, is you mentioned it. You described like um, like a desmoplastic reaction, like at the head of the pancreas. Like when we when you talk about like what that looks like, like actually looks like whenever you're in there. Like yeah, I mean, like I kind of know a desmoplastic reaction, but it's kind of like a little bit of amorphous to me. So it, it the tissue is edematous. It weeps. It uh, it's friable. It's like they have pancreatitis. The tissue is. You know, the, the fat around the pancreas and the duodenum and the omentum is, is inflamed. It's edematous. It bleeds easily. That's what I mean by 
uh, maybe desmoplastic may not be the right term, but it is like almost like they have, and it may be pancreatitis, you know, maybe by the fact that they're putting a covered metal stent into the biliary tract, you know, the common channel at the ampullary complex where the pancreatic duct and the bile duct meet, you're by definition, you're pushing that pancreatic duct, right? And patients with periampullary tumors of all sorts, when they have biliary obstruction, they they often always also have pancreatic ductal obstruction, which can lead to some pancreatitis. So it it's hard to know if it's from the stent sometimes or if it's just a t- t- tumor that's causing that kind of uh, ductal obstruction with some a mild pancreatitis. People get this sort of, that's why people with those kind of tumors often have pain. Um, distal tumors, often patients will have a little bit of chronic pain or back pain, things like that. And, you know, it's usually because something to do with the pancreatic duct is obstructed. Mark, switching gears a little bit, one of the questions I wanted to ask you that it's, it's like a question that has no good answer. How many biliary drains is enough? And the scenario that I'm going to paint for you is like medical oncology is like, if you can just get this biliary bin down a little bit lower, I think like we can give chemotherapy. And so you, you got them drained from the left and you got them drained from the right, but the biliary bin's just not where it needs to be. Okay. So any interventional radiologist that does any biliary work has had this conversation about 14,000 times. Okay. I think goals of care become so important here. All right. And what John was talking about, you know, putting a covered stent versus a non-stent, it doesn't matter if they're not going to surgery, who cares? None of us would create a TIPS without knowing if they're a transplant candidate, right? I don't think anyone should be placing a PTC in malignant disease or even benign disease without knowing what the plan is, okay? Um, At least have some concept. And so how many tubes is too many? Well, it depends. Is the patient non-resectable on hospice metastatic? I mean, you could argue one may be too many in that patient, depending on their goals, you know, whereas we've certainly put in three before in some cases. I think once you get as an arbitrary number somewhat, once you get past three, I think there need to be some serious conversations about what our goals are. The other thing I would say, and again, we've had this conversation recently, which is make sure you're not treating labs and ultrasounds, right? So we've had patients with bilirubins who are, which are pretty high or, or not coming down, but they're not that symptomatic from it. And to John's point, does it matter? I mean, if we exclude an entire liver, does it matter? Um, and so I think all those sort of, sort of need to be taken into account. John, you want to weigh in on that at all or? Well said by Mark. Yeah, I mean, you know, as, as I said earlier, you know, a real patient we have right now uh, that Mark and I have been taking care of who has recurrent disease, came in with biliary sepsis and a liver abscess and probably had chronic biliary obstruction for like six or eight months and just wasn't going to the doctor. We've drained the left side. We've drained the right anterior sector. The right posterior sector is still obstructed and bil- bilirubin's plateaued at about 14 not going anywhere for like two or three weeks. And I told the family, look, we could put a right poster sector drain in. That's not going to fix. Her. The liver is not going to get better. At this point, it is what it is. And uh, so I think, again, we have to look at the big picture for that patient. And prior for that patient, the right thing is palliation and um, getting these tubes out of them so they can go to a skilled nursing facility or hospice or home. That's another point that, again, I did I do not think about enough as I should, is what is this patient's disposition? Can they go someplace with biliary tubes? And so that sometimes can be a pediment. So a biliary tube could actually be a curse to remain in the hospital for longer than it should be. And so sort of the psychosocial aspect is something that we need to consider as well. Yeah. I just want to say, like, it's so nice, actually. Like, we don't have um, uh, HPB at uh, either one of the hospitals that um, I routinely work at. But it is nice whenever your surgical colleagues or your GI colleagues or maybe for you, John, like I are, kind of backs you up and everyone's kind of on the same page with like maybe like a hospitalist service or like an, another service who's not in, as in tune with biliary work and saying, hey, look, this is enough. And so I just want to say that yeah, I think that's why um, close collaboration, like a good relationship with, with your surgery colleagues makes okay. uh, such a big difference. So can hey, I jump ahead. on that question? Yeah, jump on it, man. So, so John, I, I'm sure you've encountered this at some point, hopefully not with me, but maybe. How do you resolve something where your interventionalists or your GI colleagues are saying, no, this isn't, this isn't indicated, and you're, and you're saying, no, no, it, it is. Can you please do this? Or vice versa. They say, you know, this person really needs surgery, and you're just like, well, they're not a surgical candidate. I don't want to perform the surgery. I'm the surgeon. You know, I get to make that decision. How do you resolve those conflicts? Well, just like we're, we're talking about having 
you know, frank conversation. First of all, you know, going back to the patient and, and what does the patient want? What's the situation? Is Do they have an option? And, you know, if they don't have a surgical option, then I, that needs to be articulated to the whole team. If it's something I want done that um, maybe I'm getting pushback from IR or GI, then and that's a that's a situation. Sometimes you get another opinion. I mean, to be honest with you, Mark, you know, you, you've got a lot of partners in your division. There's some people that I don't call for complicated things, you know. So somebody needs a a straightforward procedure, fine, whoever. I'll just say, yeah, get IR to do it. If it's something complicated, you need to sometimes have somebody that you trust, you know, can get get it done, even in a complex situation. And and I guess that's where the personal relationships that you build over the years of doing this of of who, who would you send your wife to who you know that kind of thing yeah i think that's a good point and then you know the other thing i would remind you is is remind the audience is that complex does not necessarily mean technical so there are people who can do things just as technical as you will but the thought process and sort of the follow-up i can tell you i've been referred to a lot of patients that for procedures that a first year radio interventional radiology residency resident could do but it requires a little bit of a difficult conversation or maybe a follow-up and that's, you know, could be just as important. That's a good, I, uh, let me add to that if I could, Chris. Wow. I've been fortunate enough to work with some great interventional radiologists, both here and at, at uh, University of North Carolina uh, in Chapel Hill before I came here, oh, 20 years. I've gravitated towards the interventional radiologists who behave like surgeons and physicians, not just technicians. And I can't tell you the number of times where I'll send somebody who's got a biliary stricture, maybe they've got a an anastomotic stricture from an HJ and it's benign or something. It was, and you know we send them for an initial PTC and then you're going to have this whole protocol of upsizing. And the patients come back and they're like, "Yeah, I never never saw the doctor. No one talked to me. They didn't tell me the plan." And I'm like, you know, well, you're not radiologists. I mean, but by the way, you guys are both not radiologists. You are you do things to patients. You're proceduralists. You're like surgeons, just minimally evasive. And the same goes for interventional gastroenterologists. I expect my interventional gastroenterologists to talk to the patients, have empathy for the patients, see the patients longitudinally, understand the big picture. And it's not just like they go home, oh, call, call surgery. They're your doctor. We're not your doctor. Well, you just put two tubes in my liver. You're my doctor. I can't tell you how important that is. And the people that I tend to gravitate to in the in the division here are people who behave like I do. And that's critical. That actually really warms my heart, John. Like I, um, the, the picture that you painted is like kind of the a, a newer wave of interventional radiologists. And um, I think that, I think there are more and more interventional radiologists who are getting trained exactly like that. So I hope that, I hope that resonates with some of our audience and I think that it really will. I wish I could end it on that note. There's one other scenario I just wanted to throw out there for you guys and, and we can make it quick. So Mark, do you have any opinions on placing internal external biliary drains? And, and say a patient's got not, not necessarily oligometastatic disease, um, but not completely riddled with METs, sticking drains through tumors. Like if, if you have to drain, if you know that you need a right-sided drainage going through a tumor to get drainage. Yeah, I mean, everything's obviously risk-benefit. Of course. You know, my preference is to not go through a tumor. But I'll tell you, when, we, when we've had to do it, it's usually well tolerated. If they bleed, it's a complication usually we can manage on our own. Not that that should be a, not that that should be a critical point. Um, I think that's really important that if you do something and you need to call a friend from a different specialty, that's okay. It's a team. That said, it is nice if, if, if you have that ability. And then it's a conversation, a risk-benefit both with the patient and the, uh, the multidisciplinary team. But preference not to, willing to, if there's no other option, of course. Okay. Just a quick question, Mark. Do you, um, for your uh, initial stick, um, ultrasound guided or? I always start with ultrasound guided. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, Sometimes I can't see it as well, patient's body habitus, whatever it is, but I always start with an ultrasound guided approach. You know, the conversation to have maybe with Dr. Holly on the future future podcast would be left versus right. Uh, I think that's also sort of a controversial topic where some people are married to one side versus the other, but ultrasound guidance probably as a first step should be universal at least to try. Okay. John, do you have any opinions on, on that specific scenario? Like when trains have to go through tumor, I've just seen like people fall on different sides of this sh- issue. And I'm, I'm actually very similar to Mark that, you know, if it's a risk benefit and I'd prefer not to, but if I have to, like, I'm, I, I wouldn't hesitate to put a drain through a tumor if I thought it was necessary. Yeah. That clinical scenario is relatively uncommon, 
but if it's necessary, a lot of times if you have a big tumor and let's say the left, it's more dominant on the left and we'll get a left PTC and the right will get through distally into the duodenum and then the right, the left may be just hanging out in, in the left ductal system with that and you can't get across and that's fine. I mean, I often will, that's when I'll have a conversation. I'll be like, look, we're plan don't, don't need to get across. We're planning on cutting out the left liver anyway. So, you know, if you want to drain it, great, but it's going to be, it's a sacrificial lamb. So I would expect if the bilirubin didn't come down from the right side of decompression, then that means that that patient will not tolerate a left hepatectomy because they don't have enough functional reserve or they've got cirrhosis or they've got cholestatic injury to the, to the liver and it's going to take six weeks for that liver to recover. So I don't have an absolute opposition to going through tumor if they can. Okay. You know, it's interesting that we talk about FLR all the time for, you know, prior to hepatectomy, but we don't think about it in terms of biliary disease. If the bilirubin does not respond, can you comment a little bit how, how you think about that in terms of, you know, are there quantitative cutoffs who say, well, if the bilirubin doesn't decrease by this, I'm concerned about intrinsic liver disease or something like that? Yeah. I mean, that's uh, probably underappreciated, but you know, the, in the old days when I was a student, you know, people would, we would be doing whipples on people who had a bilirubin of 20, you know, and it was, and it's bad. It's really bad, you know, causes all kinds of problems from just overall postoperative infectious things and um, dysregulation of your clotting cascades and all that stuff when you have a liver that that's backed up, that that's sick. So patient we just got transferred this week uh, had, on my service right now with the bilirubin of 27. I mean, we're not, there's no way we'll operate on that patient. I want to see her back in two weeks. And if her bilirubin hasn't come down to, let's say, less than five, then I know there's something intrinsically wrong, which would predict, because she's in her 70s, I'm like, this is a high-risk patient and with liver dysfunction. So the way they respond to biliary drainage, whether from above or below, definitely dictates the way we look at those patients as an operative risk. Well said. All right. Um, final thoughts, guys. Um, John, I'll start with you. Uh, anything that you wanted to say that you didn't get a chance to? No, it was a great conversation. I think it excites me to think about taking care of these complex patients as a team. And I think we probably, you know, the last couple of years have been with COVID, just it, it really ruined a lot of that. And uh, I miss having in-person meetings with our multidisciplinary colleagues about patients like this. And uh, it's been a bad couple of years for a lot of the reasons, but this is one reason why it's knocked back, I think, our team morale building. If you're on a team meeting at 7 a.m. and you're at home in your pajamas, I mean, it's not quite the same as sitting in a room next to, you know, your colleagues. I think there's no doubt about that. Yeah. Mark, anything for final thoughts? Yeah, I think the only, the two final thoughts I have, especially toward our interventional audience here, is get to know your team. It's very easy to be automatic and just upsize biliary tubes, but there's so much more you can offer. There's so much more that uh, collaboration lends itself to for better patient care. And the second thing is I got to echo the, the point that John made, which is be a doctor. You know, you went to interventional radiology residency or fellowship if you're older um, for a reason. You know, these patients, even if you're with them for five minutes for a tube upsize, they're now your patients. Um, look for ways to help, especially if you're not working in an advanced center you probably should double your efforts because you don't have someone like John and his team to, to sort of counteract you. So you may be bringing up things that help patient care that other um, members of the team have not thought of. So look for ways to help. That's what I teach my kids, right? Don't be asked for help. Look for ways to help. Okay. Ooh, well said. And I'll just say like uh, being at a, a community hospital, uh, both the places that I work at, sometimes interventional radiologists, um, to echo Mark's point, Sometimes you have the best grasp on exactly what's going on. Sometimes you'll feel like everyone else is kind of missing the bigger picture on this stuff. And so I, I think when uh, we, we guys, uh, we talk about like patient ownership and like being a doctor. I mean, that's just that just kind of warms my heart. And I hope like that back table keeps like kind of pushing that out. So well said. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon. 
with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer, design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, social media and PR by Ann Dang, Manisha Naganathanahali, and Manbir Singh Sadli. Administrative support provided by Jim Lui Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 